are listening to the Slash and Cast Podcast Network. Enjoy the show. <laughs> All right, folks, Justin here with a quick word before we dive in. In this episode, I chat with actor and comedian Richard Stephen Horvitz about Broadway, improv, Power Rangers, Invader Zim, sitcoms, and much more. You may know Richard as the voice of Zim himself, Alpha 5 from Power Rangers, and much, much more. So without further ado, here you go. Also, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, leave a review, all that bullshit. Aye, 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 aye. Sword on the Rangers have been captured by the Lords of Monsters, Madness, and Magic. What do we do? What do we do? Oh, aye, 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 aye. Greetings, boils and ghouls. This is your comrade, the Crypt Keeper here, reporting dead from the sanctuary of the strange. Tonight's macabre myth is a fright-filled feature, one overflowing with monsters, madness, and magic. <laughs> Say you're a kid, what sort of things would you say help spark your creativity? Were you a big reader, listening to a lot of music, building forts? What's the scoop? I was a big television watcher. I watch TV 24 seven. I'm a huge fan of TV. I still am. I'm one of those kids that was put in front of the TV set at a very young age and never really left. I was raised on shows like Speed Racer, Kimba, The White Lion, Six Million Dollar Man, The Brady Bunch, Partridge Family. I could go on and on. What, is it fair to say that you were the class clown growing up? Yeah, I think I discovered humor at a, probably around kindergarten or first grade. Prior to that, I was very introverted. I was really the once I discovered I knew how to make people laugh then yeah i was off and running it's kind of a defense mechanism too because yeah i was i was you know smaller than all the kids my age i had a funny voice even as a kid it was you know kind of like you think it's chip monkey now you can see me when i was you know prepubescent but yeah you know you learn to make people laugh and you know you kind of can control a room which i think is what i learned to do at a very young age right you change it into a superpower use it to your advantage you know exactly what sparked your initial interest in the arts? Were you a theater kid or your parents? Uh, I was of? a theater kid. I, I think I think that I was mostly a fan of two shows growing up. One was Get Smart, and I loved Don Adams, and I loved his timing. I thought it was just brilliant. Even as a kid, I thought it was funny, and I was one of the, I wanted to be Maxwell Smart, really. But also, I was really into variety shows. Like, I loved Sonny and Cher, Laugh-In. The Flip Wilson show, in particular, I really loved a lot. And really, I loved Tom Jones, or as my mom used to call it, Tom Jones from England. And so, I just started doing imitations of, like, James Cagney, and I would do Geraldine, Flip Wilson's Geraldine. I would always always do my get smart missed it by that much <laughs> and so when I was I always wanted to do television and such but when I was actually in a play at the church I grew up in I was 10 years old and the man who had written all the music for the Aristocats and a bunch of Disney films wow. a man named Floyd Huddleston had written this this musical for the church and uh, it was for kids and such and I did it and he said I want to introduce you to my agent and that was a woman by the name of Rita Kohlberg way back in the 70s and that's how I that was how I got my first agent and I started going out on commercials and I did a lot of commercials as a kid I started out as a hand model actually I, I was like one of the very first ones was a, a thing called Kent and his Cosmic Cruiser which was during the days of Star Wars since so they were like knockoff toys by all these different all these different companies like uh, Kenner Toys and when they would cut to a close up of the kids playing with the toy it would be my hands <laughs> and so my hands got more airplay than I did back then and then when I then I did a bunch of like sick I did sitcom stuff I, I did things like uh, different strokes 
And then when I was about 13, year old, 13 years old, I was cast in my first Equity production. It was a musical, Oliver, at the uh, Aquarius Theater here in Hollywood. And it was on Sunset Boulevard, and it starred Dick Sean and Stubby K and all these luminaries from theater and film back in the day. Uh, Stubby K was nicely, nicely in uh, Guys and Dolls with Frank Sinatra and wow. Marlon Brando. So I always thought that I would become a Broadway actor, which was always my dream, was to be a musical theater actor. Actor, but because I was living in LA and doing TV and film, that became my staple. And then I guess I went to college. I went to UCLA for a quarter. And while I was there, I got an audition for a TV series pilot that I thought wasn't going to go anywhere. But it was a show called Safe at Home and it was on WTBS, Ted Turner Superstation. <laughs> And I ended up doing that for three years. And while I was doing that, I was cast in a movie called Summer School. And in the 80s, I did a string of teen films, Summer School, How I Got Into College, Kid with a Ray Gun. And I never got <laughs> back to UCLA. I never got back to college. Wow. But I was majoring in theater arts anyway. So I figured, you know, I'm going to come out of college and still go out and audition. So I might as well take advantage of it now. Around 88, there was a Writers Guild strike. And uh, I wasn't working. And I didn't know what to do. And someone said, hey, you should get into voiceover. And that was like, you know, that was my entry into uh, voiceover. And that's been like my main staple for over 30 years. I still do a lot of on-camera stuff. I was the Green Grapes in the Fruit of the Loom commercial. I was in the movie uh, The Informant, where I played Matt Damon's attorney along with Tony Hale. And another one called Crazy Stupid Love. So every now and then I dust off my my (laughs) on-camera talent and give it a shot again. So you've been at it for a long time. Was it overwhelming at all? Like kind of just jumping into commercial? and no, doing all this modeling I and stuff? To do it. I knew that I wanted ah. to do it since I was five years old. There was, I, I never had stage fright. I was never nervous. The audition process, I love. Let's see, I'll tell you exactly how long it's been. I became a SAG member in 1978. Wow. So how many years is that? 40 plus. Yeah. 40 plus years. I used to joke with my friend that I would, when I was young, I would go, I'm currently celebrating 50 years in show business. <laughs> now I currently am almost celebrating 50 years in show business. As an actor, does your approach differ whether you're on stage or on screen? I approach a story the same way, and that's in that that's the way I work in voiceover. You know, a lot of people in voiceover think you start with the voice, but you don't start with the voice. You start with the story. And in everything I do, the story is more important than me. That's what I have to always remember because a lot of times we spend so much time auditioning that we think it's our job to book the job because you spend more time auditioning than you get to, than doing what you say you do. And so for me, I really always make the story important first. And then I worry about the voice and all that later. I approach it the same way on stage as I do with film, TV, or voiceover, right? It's all the same. And a lot of people think that there's a difference between voice acting and acting. And, and there is to a degree in that if you're a film actor, what you can sell in a, you know, in a giant screen with just a look doesn't translate to animation. So right. it's, uh, it's, you know, I think the best actors I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a lot of great actors, have all been voice actors. They know how to express in different ways for animation. And a lot of the voice actors that I've spoken to sort of speak to how improv has helped them a ton and it's almost they find almost a necessity in that avenue would you agree with yeah, that Yeah, and a lot of people ask me what i suggest what classes they take and i always say start with improv and sketch comedy because i did sketch comedy for years and years and years i was on saturday night live in special segments and i worked with fred willard for many many years doing sketch comedy i did it on the tonight show and the jimmy kimmel show and different things but those are always the best training grounds in my opinion Rob Paulson said the same thing. It's kind of just, yeah, iron sharpens iron. When it comes to your voices specific, well, I guess each one will be different, but how much direction do you have initially with a voice or do the, you sort of work with the director? A lot of the times the creator of the show is the director in the beginning of a show because they have the image in their head. But if, if you take something like The Angry Beavers, which was one of my first series, the creator, Mitch Shower, he loves old film and TV. He loves old horror movies. He loves a lot of the Abbott and Costello, Meet Frankenstein stuff. So when I first approached Daggett on that show, he was kind of like a Lou Costello, which is a lot like a Time Dale, which is a lot like a Nathan Lane. You know, it's just that kind of thing. And he loved that. And I've just been very lucky that the creators I've worked with know that I'm an improviser and they encourage it, you know? And when I talk about improvising, it's not like I go off on a, you know, a two page tangent. It's just that I bring something to it. So Invader Zim is a perfect example. Jonan Vasquez had an idea of what he thought Zim was, which is always that very theatrical. 
thing that <laughs> Sim does. That part was Jonan. And he wanted that, but then I brought what I brought to it, and he said it's not what he had envisioned, but he loved it, and that's that was just a happy marriage, you know. Have you done much anime dubbing? I have. Yeah, I started in. I did a lot of dubbing in the early years. I did a show called Zatch Bell for a little while. I can't remember all of them, but I did work. I did a lot of uh, ADR on on uh, things like Pompoco, The Wind Also Rises, or The Wind Rises. Not Spirited Away, but a lot of Miyazaki stuff I did. Yeah. The reason I ask is because also a lot of voice actors say that, that they struggled initially with dubbing because it's almost sort of a musical skill. I didn't struggle with it. I just didn't find the joy in playing that I do when you're talking about Western animation mainly because that's animated to a different language than ours and so our words aren't the same as they are in Japanese or other languages what it became mostly in dubbing was timing making sure you got it on the on the lip flap plus emoting as an actor and all that and it just wasn't fun for me I, I made a decision when I left that world though I do still do it occasionally I'll come back and do something I'll certainly do it on a like if it's an ADR session or something I'll come in and do it but what I made a decision was I wanted to create original characters. That was my always my goal is I wanted to create original characters. I didn't want to be a voice matcher. You know, that's a very lucrative end of the voiceover world is voice matching. I mean, look at Jim Cummings, who's been doing yeah. Who and Tigger 2 for, you know, over 30 years. Bill Farmer as Goofy, Bob Bergen as Porky Pig and Tweety Bird, etc. And they're great at it. I'm not great at it. So it's something that I just don't enjoy doing. And that's, I've got two rules about what jobs I take. And the rules are I never, I can never resent the money and I have to be able to have fun. Those are my two rules. You could always, you could have the great, the most money in the world, but if I don't enjoy the project or I'm not having fun, then I won't do it. But likewise, you could have no money, but it's a great story and I can have fun playing in that world. And that's, and I'll do the job. So I, you know, I do, I, I think that actors have a tendency to think that they have to audition for and take any job that's sent their way. And certainly I get it. Cause you know, if you're, if you, if you're resting your whole well being on it, but I'm, I'm pretty particular in the things that I choose. To do. Right. So would it be fair to say that you would just enjoy voice acting more than stage and screen? I think I enjoy stage the most of oh. everything. Stage is still my passion. I still hope to get to Broadway someday, but maybe I'll be as voiceover actor, which I hope is in his Broadway <laughs> view. Stage is still my number one love. I love voiceover. I love the process of voiceover. I love everything about voiceover. I love getting new scripts for animated series and getting to work with great actors. And even during the pandemic, we've been able to record in a group setting via zoom it's not quite the same energy as being in the room but it's just nice to see people again film i enjoy because it reaches such a huge audience even if you have like two lines in a, even if you only have like five minutes of, of screen time in a film that's a lot believe it or not and it reaches a huge audience and but i don't the process of filmmaking is so long and tedious that uh i just enjoy the ease of voice over for a couple hours hey i hear you so you just mentioned that you'd love to try broadway what's your dream role you know if you could start broadway yeah. tomorrow yeah well if i were younger it would have been you know either jesus and jesus christ superstar or or judas those are the two my two favorite roles in nice in musical theater that's my favorite all-time musical is jesus christ superstar but oh, that's a good one i love so many i love hamilton but I, i'm only right for the king in that i think i would be good as the king what other musicals are so many i love fiddler on the roof i'm getting old enough to play tevia so maybe <laughs> that would be fun Sky Superstar to Tevia. It's like, it's kind of a, a capsule. So I'm a child of the 90s. My first experience with your work was the voice of Alpha 5 and Power Rangers. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> so with that one specifically, did you have any direction going in or? That came at a weird time in my life. I was like broke and didn't know what I was going to do with my life. And I, I would, you know, I had a friend who was editing in this offline edit bay, Burbank, California. He called me up one night at nine o'clock at night. And he's like, hey, there's this guy in here and he bought this show from Japan and it's, it's horrible. Well, it's not going anywhere. They need a temp track for a robot. Will you come in and just do the voice right now? Sure. And I jump in the car and I get to the bay and I look up on the screen and the line was like, Zordon, the Power Rangers are in trouble. And Haim Zaman stood up and said, yes, that is the voice of Alpha. We will let you be Alpha. We don't have to, we don't have to affect the voice. So that came to be. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> nothing, <great. laughs> nothing fancy about it. 
<laughs> so how far along in the Power Rangers ride did you decide? Well, did you find out? Well, oh shit, this is not. This is something that's going to stick. Year, the first year, it was like through the through the roof. The first year, and you know, obviously, it's a testament that thirty some odd years later, it's still going. The thing is, is that I myself and David Yost. Billy, we were the only ones who were in every one of the Mighty Morphin from beginning to end. By the end of that, everyone else had been replaced or fired or mostly quit. <laughs> <laughs> was that a, uh, well, you don't have to say, but was it a one of your least favorite experiences in terms of yeah, working? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I wow. mean, they were not, I mean, I met great people, that part yeah. of it, but I, it went against my rules. I resented the money and that was it. They were constantly trying to cut your pay and, and they were making more money hand over fist. Yeah, I was not happy. That's when I decided to get out of that world. If you're out, out and about, which role do you say you get approached most about? Invader Zim, by ah. far is the one that people remember the most. Zim Zim was a really unique show. A lot of time like, you know, if I'm at a if I'm at a convention, they'll they'll remember most of my stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But because if you're coming up to my table, you know know my work most of the time. But Invader Zim, and I'd say my new show, A Hell of a Boss, Moxie, is really taken off. I mean, a lot of conventions lately, I've, I've signed more Moxie pictures than I have Zim pictures. But I would say people know me from Zim the most. It depends, though, on your generation, because that might know me as Zim, but others know me as, as Chaos from Skylanders. So, like, people say, that's Zim. Like, no, it's not. It's Chaos, you know? But that's just two different generations. Billy and Mandy is probably I had a ton of fun with because that was... Like I said, I've been very lucky with the creators of shows. They know that I improvise a lot. And, and Maxwell Adams, the creator of Billy and Mandy, he really let me improvise a lot. And so I'm always grateful to him for that. And I still am good friends with I'm still friends with all the show creators. You work a lot with your voice, obviously. Do you drink any teas or do any exercises like that no, to protect I the know. moneymaker? You know, a lot of my roles are very yelly. And so, no, I've just been very lucky. I think, you know, uh, hopefully they hold out. But my voice has been this way for since puberty. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so what I do is like with Invader Zim, I drink a lot of water. That's what I do is I drink. I'm constantly staying hydrated. That's the that's the key. I don't do like honey and tea. I usually just do really hot water with lemon just lemon juice in it and then I let my voice rest when I'm done with the session. I don't think people realize that working on an animated series the energy of a Zim or Billy or any of them you get really tired. It's a workout. So when I'm done with a show with a recording of an episode I'll just go in and I'll take a nap you know because I'm just I'm, I'm exhausted and I'm old so <laughs> <laughs> naps <laughs> naps out. Hey, I love naps too. How did the opportunity for Zim come about? I was working at Nickelodeon and I'd done, I was, in, I was still doing Angry Beavers at the time. And at the time they were casting for this show called Invader Zim. And I just saw like kind of these goth looking people kind of coming around. I'm like, who are these, who are these children of the night? <laughs> and like their offices, like Jonan had like dark cellophane over the lighting because the fluorescent lighting was just so horrible. And I got an audition and I went in and Jonan wanted me for Invader Zim right from the get go because he like the idea that my own voice was original but at the time i was doing the angry beavers and the executive producer of the show said well we don't want we don't want them on both shows so they went with mark hamill first and then billy west replaced mark hamill and then when angry beavers ended they hadn't aired the pilot yet and so jonah said hey you're not doing angry beavers anymore so let's let's dub over billy and submit it and they said okay and that's how i became zim out of all your roles and such what would you say has been the most challenging what's kept you up at night you know none of them really were challenging in terms of creating the character as much as there were certain lines that i had that i didn't like how i had done them like i love billy he's like one of my favorite characters but there are some times when i'll hear it and i won't understand what i'm saying and that <laughs> bothers me sometimes it's not like see what do you do with you it's like wow what what did he say and yet <laughs> People hear it, but I don't. So I, I think I don't have a tendency to really watch my shows all that much. And when I do, I go, oh, that was good. Or, but, but whenever I watched Invader Zim, I thought that was really great. Not just, not me. I'm not saying I was great, but the writing and the, and the cast and the artwork was so unique and, of, and just of a different time. You know, it was ahead of its time. But I feel that about all my shows, you know. I just think a lot of my shows were ahead of their time. I have a, a friend that my, our running joke is that most of my shows in my video games are cult classics but cult classic is just 
a euphemism for not commercially <laughs> successful. You know, Zim became commercially successful years after because of Hot Topic and, and it, Gur, 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 everywhere Gur. America loves Gur. That's my running joke. <laughs> But I don't think I find, you know, what was challenging was that at one point I was doing Invader Zim and Billy on the same day at two different studios and it was wrecking my voice. So the agency had to make it so that I would do one show on Monday and I would do the next show on Thursday. So I got that break in between rest my voice. That seems only fair. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So this is sort of kind of in the same vein, but. If you had a redo chance, maybe you could go back and have a second crack at something. What would what would that be? Well, I'd like to see Invader Zim come back because I it, I think it's just it ended too soon. And I'd love to see Billy. You know what? I'd love to see Billy and Mandy Daggett and and, and the Angry Beavers and Invader Zim all come back because Agreed. I had so much fun with them. And you know, we're living in the days of reboot, and and people are discovering them again, especially with things like Paramount Plus or Netflix or any of the other streaming services that runs our show. Shows, you know mm-hmm. i was gonna ask about streaming services did you notice a jump at cons and such and people reaching out to you maybe when streaming services started picking up oh, that's a good question did i notice anything you know i don't think so i don't think i noticed much of a change of anything because invader zim still kind of people watched it on youtube you know because you could watch episodes on youtube and places so i mean i think that if you were a fan what i did notice is if i noticed anything is that kids that had grown up watching my shows now had kids of their own mm-hmm. and they had these, you know they have these little toddlers coming up that are like fans of zim <laughs> i'm like wow cool so i think it's just that i've reached you know another generation of kids is always flattering you know okay so what would you say is the best advice you've received in your career what is the best advice? I guess the best advice I ever received in my career was from my mentor and teacher, Diana Castle, who said, stop thinking as an actor and stop th- and start thinking as a human being and go from being an impressor to being an expressor. So that is the best advice that I can give is like, don't worry about impressing, focus on expressing. And I think that's true for any medium. Sorry, uh, the name's slipping me right now, but it's the Adult Swim project that you just mentioned that you've been working on. Oh, you mean uh, YouTube, a uh, hell of a boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hell of a bus. Yeah, that's on YouTube. And that's by, created by a, 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 an amazing artist named Vivian Medrano. And Vivian has a huge following on YouTube. I mean, like 5 million subscribers. Wow. Hell of a boss. Gets regularly 12 to 19 million views per one of our episodes. And that's amazing because that beats yeah. cable numbers. Vivian's exceptionally talented and I've been fortunate enough to been fortunate enough to get to work with her. And not only that, I am also I also voice direct the show I'm on, Hell of a Boss, and another show that's coming out that I can't really talk about. But it's also a Vivian show. So how's the voice directing like for you being on the other side and directing other voice actors? I love it. I love it because I'm also a coach. I'm also a voiceover coach. I have a like a really thriving teaching class that I teach workshops of voiceover mm-hmm. acting. It's, you know, it just translates to that. In fact, Vivian was actually a student of mine because she wanted to take voiceover acting as well. So say I'm signing up for your class. What what kind of lessons do you want me to take away first day? Stop being an expresser. Stop being an expresser. <laughs> Expressor and know that it's not about the voice, that the voice does the work of the spirit of play. We play all the time. And you know, most people think that you can't you have to have a million voices to be in voiceover, especially in animation, which isn't true. I'm a living example that I don't have a million different voices. You know it's me in every show that I'm on or every video game. But I make the story more important than myself. So my world's change, my want as the person in the story changes. And so you follow me into those stories. And so when I I say the voice is the work of the spirit of the spirit it means you do voices all the time you don't even realize it you like if you're talking to a baby you go hi there what are you doing you don't think to yourself now what voice should i use <laughs> hello baby no that did, it's the voice does the spirit of the work does the work of the spirit of play that's the take takeaway people forget how to have fun people work so hard at things that it's just if they take their own fun out of it well said well said let's <laughs> sort of wind down here richard what are some of your favorite films oh wow Godfather ranks up there. I love Godfather. I love, oh, you know what I love? I love Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story with John C. Riley. I watch that over and over and over. I love uh, Kick-Ass. I watch that over and over and over and over. I love 
I love Shawshank Redemption. Great I love, movie. Uh, I love most of Albert Brooks's movies, particular defend, particularly Defending Your Life. Classic movies. I love Warner Brothers gangster movie. I love early Jimmy Cagney and Humphrey Bogart movies. I love them. I love them. I love them. I also love early silent movies like anything with Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton and especially the Marx Brothers. I love the Marx Brothers. Have you seen anything recently that's moved you? Yeah, you know what? Uh, Coda was very moving. Coda was very moving. I don't know if you've seen it. I have not. It's with Marley Matlin. I, let's see, that's moved me. Wow, that's a good question. Oh, you know what? West Side Story. West Side Story, you know, once I got past, it's not the original. And I saw what they were doing differently. I was like, okay, I'm in. And it just, it made me cry as much as the original. <laughs> They did a couple of things that I wouldn't have done that really bothered me. But other than that, that moved me a lot, like to tears, especially wow. the Maria and Anita scene. A boy like that would kill your brother, right? That was so well done. I would give the, the Best Supporting Actress Oscar to the woman who played Anita in that, which she's not awesome. for. So I'll, I wouldn't be surprised if she wins. She was... So Richard, what's on the horizon for you? Is there anything you can tell us about coming up? Uh, well... Psychonauts 2 is still out and about. It's still doing well. I've got a couple of shows. I got I got another season of Hell of a Boss that's going to come out uh, later this year. I'm working on a big video game thing that's coming out next year. Uh, so yeah, a lot of good stuff still happening. And, and you can always follow me on my uh, Instagram or Twitter. I think uh, my Twitter is Richard Horvitz. That's easy. <laughs> and my Instagram is Richard Horvitz VO on Instagram. So I always announce what's going on on there. Awesome. Richard, it's been a pleasure talking it's to you, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank All right. you. You have a great, great Take evening. Care, Justin. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye. Welcome to the night. You think you know Night Demon? Then the Night Demon Heavy Metal Podcast is for you. Step into the darkness as we peel back the curtain to give you an unprecedented, all-access look into the mind and the heart of the demon. We're talking band history, song analysis, studio anecdotes, stories from the road. It's everything a diehard Night Demon fan could want and more. This is the only place to learn the inside scoop, the deep dive trivia, the untold tales from the band members themselves and those closest to the Night Demon story. Need more? The sacred Night Demon crypt will be pried open to reveal demo recordings that have never before seen the light of day. All with in-depth commentary by the band and the people who were there for the writing and recording process. This is a gold mine, a treasure trove of all things Night Demon. Head over to nightdemon.net or wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to podcasts.